day stands at nine nine hundred. Um, that is last week we had about eight hundred and twenty, so we have uh, increased in number of participants to nine hundred this week. So the statistics are growing. Thank you. Well, thank you, and I, I, it's certainly my goal that we break a thousand to this. So let me encourage everybody to forward those emails that we send you to all of your. Uh, colleagues and friends and people in your personal network. Su Jung, could you tell us how many participants we have with us today? Yes, Elizabeth. Uh, at this moment, uh, we have 30 participants attending today's webinar with us. I hope this number goes up as we as the webinar goes by. Yes, so on. I'll, I'll, so do I. Um, I'll ask you again later on, and we'll see if we can um, have attracted a few more people. Okay, so um, let me move on to uh, presenting Arto, Arto Sumenian. I'm sure I just screwed up the pronunciation of his name, even though I had him practice with me this morning. Um, Arto is a longtime employee of Rambol Finland. This is a company which is part of the Rambol Group, a very large consulting firm in the Nordic countries and throughout the world. Arto has a Master's of Science in Water Supply and Sanitation from Tampere University of Technology in Finland. He has over 25 years of experience in leading rural and urban bilateral water and sanitation projects financed, financed by the Finnish government in Kenya, Vietnam, Namibia, and Ethiopia. So Arto, let me now turn the microphone over to you. Su Jung, if you could bring out Arto's slides and take away mine. And uh, take it away, Arto. OK, thank you, Elizabeth. Can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you, but uh, your volume is a little bit too loud. Could you adjust the volume okay. on your microphone just a little bit? Okay. Um, I don't know if anybody else has that problem. Okay, how is it now? Better? Still a little, still a, better, but still a little bit loud. Could you take it down a, oh, a little, little bit loud? Okay. Yeah, so make it quieter. Okay, how is this now? That's much is better this? for me. I hope that's the same for everybody else. Okay. Even I can put it a little bit more down. Yeah. Down, yeah. I will. I will adjust a little bit more down. That's why it's in instructing. <laughs> right. You have somebody helping you on that end. Okay. I'm going to mute my microphone uh, and let you proceed. Okay. Let's hope this is now okay. And uh, thank you, Elizabeth, and uh, welcome to everybody now. I can see almost all around the world. I was still wishing that somebody from Finland will click on, but still I don't see anybody. So <laughs> let's see when the time's going on, maybe somebody will come in. OK, let me start. And uh, let me try to finish quickly so that we have enough time also for the discussions. Um, so I'm presenting. Uh, Especially, I'm presenting this community-led accelerated wash in Ethiopia called Kowash, uh, which is now um, a new uh, government of Finland supported uh, wash program here in Ethiopia. Uh, but it has a long history, which will come soon a little bit more in detail. But before going really into the project, let's see something about Ethiopia itself. Um, I think so that most of you, you know that Ethiopia is a very large country. It has uh, 70 million people. Most of them are living in the rural areas. Still the figures are around uh, 80 to 90 percent of the population living in the rural areas. It's more than one million uh, square kilometer large country. Beautiful country rich with different cultures and languages, and uh, facing also a lot of problems, which we know globally here, especially the problem of the drought. So we are living in this kind of situation. And uh, because we are talking not only here on water supply, but some words also of sanitation. This uh, 
this figure uh, represents the, the, the main uh, the regions in Ethiopia, where uh, one year ago the, the national average uh, access to sanitation was uh, almost 60 percent, and uh, and and you can see that in some regions like Somali region and Afar, it is still less than and Gambela still less, less than 10 percent. Somali and Afar are these pastoralist areas, so it is uh, much more difficult to do the permanent sanitation there. But some regions are really progressing fast, like the, the southern region, which is called here SNRP, and, and Tikrai. Amhara is also coming up quickly. So, um, But the most sanitation which is needed here is still in Oromia, uh, although it's 56 percent, but uh, the population in Oromia is almost 30 million people, so in, in terms of number it still needs a lot of uh, work to be done. Then when we go to the water supply, the situation is much, much better here. Um, I have to say that in, in this post, uh, both uh, graphs, uh, the figures are at the moment the official government uh, figures. But recently, Ethiopia uh, conducted a wash inventory. And uh, almost this wash inventory has almost uh, been now finalized. And the results will be available. So these figures will be uh, definitely revised very soon. But more or less, it gives the indication where Ethiopia is going on. And especially here, I'm focusing into the rural water supply, not not urban in this presentation, because the the, the main problem in the water supply is still in the rural areas. So then, some words about Kowash. This I don't have. Unfortunately, I don't have many photos from Ethiopia in this presentation. So you have to go to our website, which I will give a little bit later on, to find more how the Ethiopia looks like. But this tells uh, very clearly this photo of the small girl carrying the cherry can and uh, with uh, not so very nice good clothes. So this is the situation where we are, how the water is moving in Ethiopia. The conditions are not so easy. They are difficult. The Kolos project, um, it this uh, it was just established now uh, nine months ago, and its purpose is to support the establishment of the community managed project funding mechanism, in, especially in rural water supply and sanitation, to accelerate the implementation of the universal access to water and sanitation in Ethiopia. Um, it started in, in May 2011, practically it was in July 2011. Um, presently, the agreement is until the 2014, but we are now uh, negotiating that it will continue up to the 2016. And the total government of Finland contribution to this program is 22 million euro, and Ethiopian government contribution is 9 million euro, which is very remarkable contribution. Uh, we are working, uh, the, the COAS project is working in the beginning in four main regions, which are Amhara, Tikrai, Oromia, and Southern region, which you were already seeing on these graphs, also some slides before. And Benishan Ulgumus region is having a separate government of Finland uh, supported program ongoing. And uh, all these uh, projects, all this uh, together, are uh, aiming now in three years to achieve one and a half, almost one and a half million uh, beneficiaries. Um, based on this, uh, this one, the average uh, per capita cost, including all the project costs, will be 18 US dollars per capita. The, uh, the CMP is a new concept here in Ethiopia. Uh, uh, not a new concept in the whole Ethiopia, but new concept in most part of the Ethiopia. Uh, it has been tested already some seven, eight years in, in two regions of Ethiopia. I'm coming to that one now. Uh, 
it started in Amhara uh, in 2003. Uh, the, the program, government of Finland supported program uh, started already in 1994, but up to 2003, the support was provided on conventional way of implementing the rural water supply and sanitation. Then in 2003, we started to think how we should change the whole system to improve the sustainability of the water supplies and also to increase the implementation rate. And we came to the conclusion that the, the real solution to, to make the water supply sustainable is to increase the ownership of the community. And how to do it? Uh, we selected that the best way is to do it to delegate the power of also the financial management and uh, uh, the whole implementation of the water supply uh, to the people themselves. That time it was called the uh, Community Development Fund approach. Later on uh, in 2011 it was changed to the Community Managed Project approach. I will tell you later on what happened on that moment. Um, uh, so this testing has been uh, going on in Amhara region, uh, first in 12 uh, Woredas. Here we are calling the districts Woredas. And, uh, and then later on it was extended to 27 Woredas from the government of Finland support and 8 uh, Woredas from the UNICEF support. And also it was tested also in another region, it was already scaled up to so-called Benisangul and Kumus region, where the, uh, which is totally different kind of culture and conditions. I'm coming to that one also a little bit later on. What is this community managed project approach? So it is really an uh, approach which gives the power to the people themselves to manage the, also the investment funds in WASH projects. And uh, traditionally, uh, the water supply projects in Ethiopia are implemented so that uh, the funds are channeled to the district government, and the district government is procuring uh, all the uh, necessary materials and palms, and, and the community is participating in this process. Now, in community managed project, the whole concept has been switched upside down, where all the funds are going, uh, not all the funds, but the, all the investment funds are going to the community, and community is then leading the project, and the government is only participating now in the community-led projects, providing, of course, the capacity building for the community so that they can implement their own projects. This uh, approach, which was now tested in Amhara and Benishangul Gumus region, was evaluated by the uh, Water Supply Program Africa, which is the World Bank uh, WSP program in 2010, and they came to the conclusion that this uh, approach uh, is really increasing the ownership and sustainability of the water points, and also to uh, it has uh, been, it has um, facilitated the great improvement in the construction speed of the uh, water supplies as well. And they fully recommended in this uh, evaluation that Ethiopia should adopt this into their national uh, wash strategy. Similar visits were made also by the Ministry of Finance and Economic Development and the Ministry of Water and Energy to those projects, and they came to the same conclusion. And as a result, the Ethiopian government revised its WASH implementation manual. It was called that time WASH implementation manual. And then in this revision process, uh, the name was changed to National WASH Implementation Framework and the, the community managed project approach in financing was uh, integrated into the national strategy. And when that happened, uh, then the government of Finland said that, yes, fine, we are very happy this community managed project is now 
as a national strategy, so we are ready to help the Ethiopian government uh, in scaling up and uh, implementing it. Uh, in Ethiopia, um, there are many ways to channel the, the money to the community. It was investigated in Amhara region, and we find out that the most efficient way is to use the, uh, as a financial intermediary uh, the microfinance institution. We were investigating the possibilities to use the banks and cooperatives and also the government structure, but we came to the conclusion that microfinance institution is the best option. And, uh, <clears throat> but uh, the, the situation here in Ethiopia is that the uh, microfinance institution networks is covering uh, very uh, big part of the Ethiopia, uh, and then uh, that will give good benefits. I'm coming back to that one also a little bit later on. Uh, the other one uh, option also is to use the government uh, uh, funding channeling, but this has not been experienced in Ethiopia yet, uh, and there are some legal obligations also to, to do it, so that the government uh, is not allowed just to give the money for the unlegalized body, so it needs some development. At the moment, the community managed project financiers are uh, mainly the government of Ethiopia, government of Finland, and UNICEF. And UNICEF is, is getting uh, funds for their implementation, not only from the UNICEF, but also from the government of Netherlands and also the Canadian CEDA. So these are more or less now the total CMP contributions to, uh, to Ethiopia until the 2016. The partners in CMP are different consultant companies. The, the NIRAS was there already. You can see then the government of Ethiopia, the, the government of Finland. NIRAS is a Finnish consultant company, and Rambo is also the, both NIRAS and Rambo are Scandinavian consultant companies. Also, the International Water and Sanitation Center is in, in uh, partnership with uh, COWASH and Rambo and, and UNICEF. So, in the CMP, the main characteristics are that the communities are fully responsible of the funds transferred to them, and, and they are using them for the investments. Um, before they can get the funds, they have to demonstrate their willingness and capacity also to finance the future operation and maintenance management. Uh, so, in that sense, uh, they are contributing also cash uh, we call it upfront cash contribution for the operation and maintenance, which is saved also in the microfinance institution. So the whole implementation is fully, fully dependent on the community's own initiative and then their own proactiveness, and, and, and that's the way how it works. And the government responsibility is then to build their capacity. Uh, the National WASH implementation framework uh, defines that the, there is a rule that the, community, uh, that the whole uh, project is not uh, subsidized. There should be 15% community contribution to the, to each, uh, to the investments. And uh, this is a general uh, recommendation, but there are some variations between the regions. So, more or less, again, uh, let's see why this community managed project approach. First of all, to increase the ownership. Ownership automatically increases the improvement of functionality. More people uh, feel that this is their own project, more they take care of it also. And at the same time, it increases the community's capacity to implement their other development projects also like uh, there might be some building of the bridges or uh, or mills and uh, dams and uh, irrigation systems and harvesting systems with different multiple use of water things. So their capacity is at the same time improved. And it changes the, the district role to become a facilitator instead of being an implementer. 
when the district is implementing, there is always the concept of uh, participation and handing over. But in the community managed project, there is a community leadership and there is no handing over because the project belongs to the community from the beginning. Community managed project improves the efficiency of the implementation. We have, we have examples where the district capacity was to implement 20 to 30 water points in a year, but after the introduction of the community managed project, the efficiency went even up to 140 water points annually. One good uh, advantage of the community managed project is that it will bring also the local private sector we can call them local merchants, much more closer to the community, because now once the money for the investments is in the hands of the community, then they go to the, the, to the closest merchants, uh, procure those materials and equipment. And then that means that the, 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 the local merchants have to be also now active to bring the materials and equipment closer to the community, and in that sense, uh, it automatically improves the, the supply chain closer to the users. And once, once now the, the whole project concept is also uh, connecting the microfinance institution, it will bring the credit facilities also much closer to the community. Although the, the, fa the, the project at the moment are uh, the, um, uh, projects uh, from the uh, grant uh, uh, financing, but the credit facilities are closer there for other multiple use of services. Why then this microfinance institution? In, in many parts of Ethiopia, the microfinance institution is, is there. Uh, it, it is very flexible because they have their own uh, funds also for the use. And if the donor grant money will delay for some reasons, the community, the, the microfinance institution can use their own funds uh, instead of uh, closing the project. So uh, this kind of buffering capacity uh, is very good. Um, nearly all the operation and maintenance savings done by the community are done in the microfinance institutions. People also have their own saving accounts in the microfinance institutions. The microfinance institutions have much better outreach than the normal banks. Although the bank network is very much increasing at the moment in Ethiopia, uh, but there are still districts where the bank is not even existing. But the microfinance institution might have uh, their offices even at the sub-district level. Microfinance institution is very much community focused. It is its own mission also to develop the community. People have much easier to access the microfinance institution than the commercial banks because they are they are they are more acquainted to, and to use them. And the microfinance institution brings the multiple use uh, linkage into the picture. At the moment also, in Ethiopia, the microfinance institutions are developing the micro-insurance, which can be also used for the water supplies, and that is definitely uh, going to be a big step in the operation and maintenance and future rehabilitations. And uh, sharing and uh, promoting the microfinance institution and the community managed uh, funding uh, possibilities uh, they are synchronized good, very well with the microfinance institution. This slide gives you some examples of the efficiency. In the beginning, when we started in uh, 1994, uh, phase one, which was a four, all the phases here are four-year phases, and more or less uh, covering the same number of the uh, districts. So we were able to increase the project efficiency from 10,000 euro to 3,000 euro uh, during the project period, uh, during the whole program period, which means approximately 17 years in this one. And this, this figures here include all costs, including the technical assistance, capacity building, 
household sanitation, water supply investment, only uh, sanitation investments have been deducted from this calculation. And this shows the similar thing in practice. Uh, until 2003, you can see the implementation rate was not so great, it, although it was progressing. But up immediately when CMP approach was introduced, the implementation uh, rate was really increased. The photo also on the background shows very typical condition of the spring protection work going on by the community here in Ethiopia. Uh, this shows also how the uh, <coughs> actual expenditures compared to the investment and operational and technical assistance services have developed. Uh, like in the beginning, when establishing the program, uh, the operational and technical assistance was very high, and then the investment part was very low. But very quickly and rapidly, the, the use of investment was increased, and the operational and technical assistance costs were decreased. And this is the whole process. Um, Without going into two details, let's see now. At the moment, um, at the moment, the financiers are mainly uh, sending their grants to the regional level, to the Bureau of Finance. That is the uh, blue dotted line. Uh, but in future, because at the moment uh, the Ethiopian government has, uh, are. Uh, they have as the, they have now in the final stage of finalizing the the wash implementation framework and uh, there has been also developed a memorandum of understanding for the wash coordination and implementation once these steps have been finalized and it, it's going to be very very soon now it means that ethiopia has established uh, really the basis to call for uh, sector void by the approach in WASH. And that means that then at the federal level uh, we are planning to establish the consolidated WASH account uh, in the Ministry of Finance. So in the future the financier will, will bring the money directly to the Ministry of Finance level. Uh, in the process also the regional governments have uh, funds and they will bring their money into the WASH financing there at the regional level. Then from the Finance Bureau, the money goes two different ways down to the uh, district. Uh, the, the red line shows that how it goes, uh, the red line shows the investments which are channeled through the microfinance institutions to the community, and the green light is, uh, arrow shows that how the capacity building funds are channeled uh, through the micro uh, district finance office. So uh, the capacity building is done by the district finance office and then the community themselves are procuring the goods and services. Uh, there are many uh, details in this process, but we don't have time now in this short period to go all in these ones. The accountability thing is here more or less ensured so that the once the community is withdrawing the money from the microfinance institution, they withdraw it normally in three different installments, and each installment is uh, authorized by the district uh, WASH team, and then uh, before they can uh, withdraw the second installment, they have to report the usage of their money also with the, the district uh, WASH team and then they're authorized for the second in installment and so on for the third one. And once the project is completed, then uh, then the, the project is closed and the, all the records of all the, the funds utilized and everything is there in the district watch team. In implementing this kind of approach, we face also a lot of different kind of challenges. This is just some, some of them. There is still a lot of skepticism and a lot of uh, people, they don't believe that the communities can really manage this kind of implementation. And uh, 
in, in that sense, this has become like uh, like being, uh, being being a priest, you know, uh, just preaching some kind of religion that you have to believe that the people really have this capacity to manage their own projects. Best way of preaching this one is to just to to bring the people to see, and seeing is, is more or less than the believing. Of course, there are limitations. Uh, once we are doing these things, uh, more simple the technology is, much more easier this kind of project is than to manage by the community. Uh, when we bring more high-level technologies, such like drilling or uh, uh, electric pumping or elevated water tanks, and distribution systems, then it becomes uh, much more challenging and difficult. Uh, but there are experience already where the community is managing such kind of things. And uh, one thing which I forgot to mention that I have also worked in Nepal for three years. And uh, in Nepal, the com uh, we were using the similar approach of the community managed project where the money was sent to the people. And in Nepal, the, the normal technology which was used was the gravity schemes, and it was working perfectly there as well. In Danish and Gumus region, now we are now testing this use of the high-level technologies, and once this is tested, then we can start thinking to scaling up that one also to other parts of Ethiopia. Um, one thing is also that at the moment most of the rural wash programs are still implemented by using the so-called district managed project approach. So, so the, the challenge is there to find the balance, how to improve the community management uh, approach and how to scale up then the Woreda managed project approach. I have seen also uh, things going on in Ethiopia now in one district they are using two different approaches. One is the community managed approach, one is this district managed project approach. And the uh, experience shows that community managed project approach is really progressing much faster there than the district managed project approach. So once the people see that the uh, community managed project approach works, then they automatically would like to scale down the district managed project approach. Uh, so this is more or less what I would like to say today, and we can start the discussions. I would like you to visit this website. Uh, we have put a lot of uh, things already about the CMP in Ethiopia on that website. And not only CMP, but also of the Ethiopian wash sector uh, as such. So, so this is a good uh, base to, to start sharing the experience and knowledge. Thank you so much for listening, and uh, now I'm sure that a lot of questions will come. Thank you. Thank you very much, um, Arto. It's particularly your use of uh, microfinance institutions that uh, I think is very interesting for people. So now let me move on to our discussants and give them the initial chance to make some comments. Uh, we have as our first discussant, uh, Tesfai Bekalu. Tesfai has a master's in regional development planning and management from the University of Science and Technology in Ghana. And he also has a postgraduate diploma in regional planning from the University of Dortmund in Germany. His bachelor's of science was in agricultural engineering. Uh, before joining the World Bank, Tesfai worked as a regional planner, an irrigation engineer, and a rural water supply specialist in Ethiopia. Tesfai began working for the bank as a consultant in 2002, and in 2008 took up a staff position with the bank as a water supply and sanitation specialist. He is currently the task team leader for two bank projects in South Sudan. Although he is now based in Juba, today he is sitting in Addis Ababa. Tesfai, uh, welcome. I turn the microphone over to you. Uh, Tesfai, if you're speaking, we don't hear you yet. Have you unmuted your microphone? Tesfai? Sujung, can you see if Tesfai has... Um, ah, yes, like can you hear me now? Oh, okay. Yes, perfectly. Welcome, welcome. 
I'll turn it over to you. Yeah, now. thank you, Elizabeth. Thank you, Elizabeth. Uh, I, I think I have an advantage of uh, uh, an advantage of uh, looking what community management uh, has managed to do uh, while Arthur was working in Amhara region because we were working side by side uh, under World Bank financed uh, Ethiopian Social Rehabilitation and. Uh, Development Fund, uh, uh, which has uh, a big uh, rural water supply component. So uh, I have seen what community management can do, and uh, I, 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 I confirm that everything what Arto has said is true. Uh, this is what I can say. On the positive element of uh, community management, uh, Arto has uh, drawn our attention to the experience uh, the program obtained in Amhara region as well as also more recently in the last four years in Benish and Gold. Uh, it's focused on community management uh, and then particularly its impact on sustainability uh, is more than true. Uh, today uh, if you go to the uh, project areas. Uh, I think, uh, if I'm correct, uh, functionality of the schemes stands at 98 or above percent. At any point in time, if you go uh, to the uh, project uh, sites, uh, schemes are functioning well managed, well reserved. Uh, the user fee is working very well. Uh, the schemes are very, uh, very good, clean, tidy. Uh, uh, so uh, sustainability is not an issue when it comes to uh, this particular project. Moreover, particularly the use of financial intermediaries uh, is an excellent, uh, an excellent uh, introduction, particularly in a country like Ethiopia. Uh, where the formal banking facility is uh, concentrated only in the major urban areas, uh, the use of uh, microfinance institutions to facilitate uh, community water supply schemes is an excellent innovative uh, innovative approach. Uh, I would like to to respond even to some of the skeptical the skeptics that uh, Arto has indicated uh, several times. Uh, many, many people, many people uh, have raised, as Arto indicated, about communities' capacity, particularly in terms of financial management and on managing fiduciary aspects, both financial management and, and community procurement. But. Uh, for skeptics, my 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 uh, my response uh, to people who are questioning uh, this kind of uh, issue is that with a proper coaching and then with a proper closer follow up, uh, communities can can manage financially and as well as also do uh, the procurement. At, uh, at the community level, and then secondly, also for those uh, who are questioning the use of uh, this uh, community management, particularly for complex schemes, because as it happens, uh, this project was largely uh, using this approach for hand dug well based and then spring development technologies. There are some people who are questioning the use of uh, this approach for, let us say, complex technologies like that of boreholes and small water distribution networks at, uh, or multi-village schemes. But my, again, my, my uh, response uh, uh, on this is that uh, still, uh, personally, I believe that uh, with a proper adaptation uh, the approach that we are using for hand dug wells definitely can be uh, used also for uh, so-called uh, 
complex technologies. So I, I feel that uh, with proper adaptation, uh, smaller schemes, boreholes, motorized schemes, multi-village schemes can use also uh, this the same approach. Having mm -hmm. said uh, all these positive, uh, positive things about, about the program, uh, uh, I'd like uh, you, Elizabeth, uh, the moderator, to allow me uh, to raise also my own questions, uh, which probably uh, need to be clarified. Uh, because one of, one of the questions, uh, no one is questioning the advantage of this uh, approach. Uh, the advantage, the multiple advantage that we can get in terms of uh, empowering the communities as well as also improving the sustainability of the schemes as well as also um, particularly in this area of decentralization whereby the government uh, wants all activities to be decentralized down to the community level. This approach is really uh, a wonderful approach and no one is questioning uh, about its usefulness. Uh, similarly, uh, again, as I indicated, the use of financial intermediaries uh, is also an excellent approach. But one of the critical questions uh, that many of us, including myself, are, are raising is that the capacity building need uh, that is needed to bring communities to bring uh, districts uh, to this level. Uh, because let us take two different communities, one under, under this project and one outside this project. And then the question that I would like to raise is that how, mu how much does it take to bring uh, a community outside this program to, to, the, le to the level uh, communities have reached under this uh, project because uh, one of one of the questions that many of the practitioners here in the ground are asking is that this program has been uh, in Amhara region for the last eight years and then basically it has been uh, concentrating in a couple of districts in Amhara region. Now the question is why is the Amhara regional government not able to to expand it, to scale it up uh, in in the other districts. For your information, Amhara region, I know that districts in Ethiopia are increasing every day, but uh, the latest information that I have is Amhara region has some 200 plus districts, and uh, my understanding is that this program was working in 28 uh, districts. Now the question is that why if it is easy, if it is not uh, the capacity building need, why is it difficult for Amhara region not to use this program and then to use it in all over 200 uh, districts? Why is the Amhara region still uh, relying heavily on the project, particularly when it comes to the capacity building? So by projecting this question, the, the next question is that, is it scalable? Uh, when we uh, take out uh, the attributes of the sector partners, including that of Finland or UNICEF, can this program, can this approach, can, be, can it be scaled uh, using government's own capacity? Uh, uh, that's the kind of just question. And then let me, let me stop here, Elizabeth. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Tesfai. Uh, it, let me go on and introduce Bob and give um, him a chance to make his remarks. And then, uh, Arto, if you would like to make a response to the discussion remarks before we move into the question and answer period, you can just let me know. So um, Bob Roche has a master's in civil engineering and in public health and also a PhD in environmental health sciences from the University of California at Berkeley. Bob joined the Water and Sanitation Program in 1984 and then joined the bank in 1992 as a water supply and sanitation specialist. 
While at the bank, he worked in particular on water supply and sanitation for villages, towns, and low-income communities in urban centers, both in regard to community dialogue on policies and principles for um, sustainable water <coughs> supply areas and in um, preparing and supervising bank investment projects. He was the task team leader for a, um, at least one major rural water supply and sanitation project in Ethiopia. Bob was also a member of the design team for the AFRIDEV hand pump, and he was part of the bank team that built the international consensus around taking a demand-driven, district-based, community-managed approach to rural water supply. I highly recommend the report that Bob co-authored on sm small town water supply and sanitation, which is available on the World Bank website. Bob retired from the bank in 2008 and now works as a consultant. So I'm very pleased to turn the microphone over to him. Take it away, Bob. OK, can you hear me? Perfectly. perfectly. I can hear you perfectly. Go ahead. Hi, everyone. Um, yeah, well, first, I would just like to uh, say that Arto has been working in Ethiopia for longer than I have even. Actually, I stopped about four years ago. And he feels like a prophet crying in the wilderness, trying to get, you know, to the, the ultimate goal of, you know, community-based procurement and management of rural water supply. And I think he and uh, various others have done a great deal to get to where we are today. He's still pushing on community-based procurement, but I think we're almost there. And what I'd like to do just in a couple of minutes is give a little bigger picture to uh, what this is all about in Ethiopia, because you have a country with 80 million people, 10 regions, four of which are quite big. You've got uh, Ten years ago, there were 450 districts or Wurda. Now, I think there's over 600. So the biggest challenge, and ten years ago, the coverage in rural water supply was about 20 percent. Now it's probably mm, about 40 percent, perhaps. But the real challenge has been how do we build the capacity in the country, and how do we decentralize so that we can reach people throughout the country. And so there was a great effort and a lot of time was spent on getting the program based on district rural water and sanitation programs. So the national program is really based on some 600 district programs. And the next step was to encourage a lot of financing was to switch from sort of a project mode to a financing mode where whoever wanted to invest in the country would put money through the Ministry of Finance to the regional finance bureaus and then to the Wurda. Because Wurda are responsible not just for rural water infrastructure, but for all the infrastructure and all of the planning in their districts. So water has to fit in with the bigger picture and has to be managed that way. Um, Having said that, I think we're, we've gotten to that point. We've also, um, I think, proven over and over again in Ethiopia and, and elsewhere that community-based management of water supply is fundamental to sustainability. We're like I was saying at the beginning, sort of at the point where we have our prophet crying in the wilderness that the final step really is to have communities be able to finance, manage, plan their own water supply, where they do the procurement themselves. And I think that Arto and the people in Amhara have done a great job in showing that that can be done. And as Testify said, the question is, can we really scale that up to all 450, 600 water to in the country? But regardless of whether we use a financial, a microfinance institution, or funds go from the water to the district to the community, the real 
challenge now is to get communities to do the, the procurement. And as Tessa Fai said, that it's all a question again of capacity building. How do we go from where we are now to where we can make that happen? And as always, there's always the challenge from one level down to get the next level to give up their responsibility. So first it was to get the regions to give up doing all the procurement for everything in rural water supply. The challenge now is to get the water to, to give that up and to turn at least the lower technology options over to communities. So anyway, I think that, that as a prophet, Arturo can be happy, happy that he is prophesying what will happen in the next few years, I think. So anyway, it's over to all you all, you all now, and I look forward to your comments and questions. Um, Arto, do you want to say something in response to Tesfai and Bob's remarks, or should we move to the question and answer period with our participants? Um, thank you, Elizabeth. Let me say just a few words, and then we go to the questions and answers. Um, yeah, that's why I was raising this issue, really, that how to scale up uh, by using the, the government themselves, the, the capacity building of the new uh, water. That's why they have not done it. That was the question also like that. Um, for me, it's difficult to, to answer to that one. I'm working now already at the federal level, not anymore at the regional level. Um, but I have, I have a sense that, that uh, now I'm not the prophet anymore alone. Uh, now everybody is preaching the same thing here and say that yes, we have to go to the community managed project approach. All the, they say all the rural water supply should be done by the community managed project approach. Um, anyhow, near, nearly all projects are possible to be done like that. Uh, so, I believe that there is now the momentum really to, to start building this capacity. Uh, we have been developing new kind of ways of capacity building also and how to replicate it. One could, uh, a new way of building the capacity uh, is called here uh, so-called GLOWS. Uh, it calls uh, Guided Learning on Water Supply and Sanitation and uh, which is very much of self-learning issue and uh, so that when the basic capacity is given to the Voredas through the traditional way, then they can continue on their own to develop their capacity through the clear practical exercises and examples. So I believe that this is one of the solutions how we can really scale up the capacity building. Um, the second thing uh, also is that um, that these uh, districts, actually, uh, Bob, there are now more than 700 districts already in Ethiopia, and, and the number is increasing annually. <laughs> so they are splitting the big district to the smaller and smaller. So, so it is really a challenge. But um, but I have been preaching now this religion now also in the Krai region, also in southern region and Oromia region, and the response has been very positive. So once we build this uh, this momentum that people really support this uh, scaling up, I believe that uh, it will it will really happen, and we are we are only just happy to run uh, run after and then how to really support this movement. So let's let's now go to the questions and answers, and let's hope that I can keep better answers in future. <laughs> okay, um, thank you very much. Uh, Su Jung, could you bring out our question and answer box? What I'm going to do is try and feed you questions on similar uh, topics at um, one right after uh, the other. So we have a whole uh, series of questions, and I apologize in advance. We can't get to everybody's, but we have a whole series of questions on the microfinance uh, institutions themselves. So could you start with this um, question from Alex Bacallian about what is the penetration of MFIs in Ethiopia, and would the program work without them? 
Yeah, okay. Um, I, I tried to say it already in my presentation, but the penetration of MFI in Ethiopia is, is very high. Um, all of the regions have one major microfinance institution which is reaching all districts of the region and even they have several uh, sub-divisional offices in the region also. So when you say 700 Boredas or 700 districts, uh, I'm not sure about the, the full figure, but I can say that three times more uh, are the microfinance institution offices in the whole country. So I think so we are close to 2,000 at least at the moment. Okay. Okay, thank you. Yeah. And we have a couple of questions um, more here about the accountability of the microfinance institutions and what the um, incentives are for them and also if you could go a little bit more into how the funding flow and oversight works. Thank you. Okay. Um, yes, the, the microfinance uh, incentive is so-called commission. In Amhara and Tigray and Southern region, we have agreed now that the microfinance institutions will charge 3% commission of the funds they are channeling to the communities. In Benish and Gumus region, uh, where the population density is much, much less than in Amhara and other regions, the, the microfinance institution is charging 7% commission. Um, uh, then uh, the, the second question, in what part of the funding flow is the oversight built in at the MFI or the Bureau of, hold on, let me read the whole thing, Bureau of Finance. Um, yeah, the, the process is so that um, the Bureau of Finance uh, is entering into the agreement with the microfinance institution and uh, based on the uh, requests from the districts, then the, micro, uh, the Bureau of Finance is sending money to the microfinance institution. Microfinance institution is reporting back to the Bureau of Finance uh, rec uh, about the disbursements of the funds to the communities. So that, that's the way how it is reported. So it is the Bureau of Finance who is really uh, looking after the whole thing, not the microfinance institution. Microfinance institution is only uh, financial intermediary channeling the money. Okay, thank okay. you. Um, yeah, David had a, a very specific question about whether the microfinance institutions give uh, equipment rather than money. I think he's a little bit concerned that the money could be diverted. Yeah, the microfinance institution does not give any equipment. They, they are really giving the money only and the communities themselves are pro procuring the materials and equipment. Um, like Bob was mentioning also one challenge in this procurement process, and uh, I have to say that at the moment the, the, it has been built so in the districts that the district wash team is assessing the material markets at the district level, and. Uh, and, and they are informing the communities that uh, you can buy these and these materials from these and these shops and the prices are like this. So the communities when they go to, to buy their materials and equipment, they know exactly how much they should pay and uh, so, so they are not going blindly to just to pay whatever the merchants will ask. Okay. Um, Susan okay. would like to... Let's go yeah, more. Yes. Thank you. Susan would like to know uh, what percentage of the upfront money communities have to put away for um, operation and maintenance, and what is the amount that they save at the microfinance institutions for operation and maintenance? Yeah, uh, yeah. The definition for the upfront cash contribution is that uh, it should. It should be the amount which will cover the operation and maintenance for one year of the water point. And uh, at the moment, it is somewhere there uh, in Ethiopian birds between 1,000 and 1,500 birds. Uh, so less than $100. Okay. 
Um, I hope I'm not taking you backwards on these uh, questions, but I had a number of them. Whoops, let me make them a little bit larger so everybody can read them. Um, uh, just to talk you more mean tone, about yeah. The, yeah, about the um, whether the Waredas are ready to facilitate this approach okay. and what kind of systems they have, um, and and that was. Um, Abu's question pretty much yeah. as well. Yeah, sure, sure. This is my friend Ton from IRC. Uh, hi, nice to see you. Uh, nice, to, nice to have you, Ton, on, online. Um, yes, um, definitely the, the Boredas or the district, they play a very important role in these things. And the, the Boreda or the district uh, wash team is controlling the whole process. So it is their mandate uh, to approve uh, the applications done by the community for their projects. And it is the district who is then signing the agreement with the community for the funding. And, uh, and then even when the funds are actually transferred to the community, it is the district wash team who is approving the transfers normally in three installments. And uh, between each installment, the community will report the, the use of the funds. They bring the original receipts to the worst uh, technical team. And uh, based on these funds, then once they have used 80% of the first installment, then they will authorize the second installment, and so on. And then the, the next question is also more or less what is the role of the local government? So I think so that's the same thing. Uh, yeah. This, uh, we had a, yeah, we had another question that perhaps is um, was speaking specifically about the legal basis for the okay. um, wash yeah. arms and, and the, the difficulty yeah. in accessing IM and the yeah. yeah. Very good, very good question. Here um, uh, this is uh, at the moment, uh, there is already uh, a, a process to legalize this uh, WASHCOS. We call them WASHCOS here, not WASHCOMS. Anyhow, we are talking the same executive committee of the community. Uh, it's possible now to legalize this WASHCOS, although the, the practice has not yet fully started, but uh, most of the regions have already prepared the necessary uh, proclamations and directives to do it. Uh, at the moment, uh, the, the, at the moment, uh, anyhow, the swashkos I have not yet been legalized, but there is a clear agreement that uh, that once there are three signatories for the account, uh, then then they can access the money uh, without uh, legalization. When we go to the possibility that the government of Ethiopia is directly uh, giving money uh, to the swashkos then the legalization at the moment at least is definitely required. So so once the legalization will progress, then we can also move from the microfinance institution fund channeling mechanism closer also to the government uh, fund channeling mechanism. Okay, thank you. Um, switching topics here, we had uh, quite a few questions on uh, how the micro insurance um, system works. Could you, um, Albert, I think, summarizes it up. So if you could just explain how that works, how the micro-insurance system works in the community water projects in Ethiopia. Yeah, yeah, good. Uh, anyhow, yeah, I can, uh, that's why he's already uh, offering me his assistance, but I can, I can tell about this microfinance at the moment. At the moment, it is still uh, very, very, very much under, uh, 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 hold on. Uh, yeah, it's very, much, very much under development. And uh, let's close your microphone. Yeah, very much under development. Yeah, yeah. He closed his microphone. Now it's not echo anymore. Yes, good. Um, but uh, the idea is that uh, this microfinance uh, insurance uh, is not covering the actual technical problems. It is more to have an insurance if the water point dries up and the community is really left without water. So it is more or less uh, planned at the moment 
to to secure that if there are that kind of climate change uh, problems coming, then the community will get funds to to build their new water supply if the the present fails totally. Okay. Um, we have okay. another question mm -hmm. here about mm -hmm. um, what is the decision process to ensure that the communities are choosing the best available uh, solution for them? I guess that means, you know, like which which kind of water supply they yeah, should yeah. Sure, construct. sure, sure. Okay, yeah, the process is so that uh, once the community applies uh, their water supply system, uh, they already describe in this application the, the system they have planned to uh, to use. Uh, once the, wash, the, the district wash team is receiving their application, they are just uh, doing so-called uh, desk uh, analysis or desk appraisal, and if the desk appraisal fulfills all the, the pre-criteria to approve the project for the funding, then immediately they agree for the field appraisal. And this field appraisal is very important where all the community members are participating. And when I say all, it means that all the people without legs and without eyes and uh, even the mental, everybody is participating in this appraisal so that we ensure that, that, uh, that, that this uh, proposed project is really benefiting all the beneficiaries. And in the same process also, the, uh, the technical option proposed by the community is apprised, and if there is a need then to change the technical uh, option, then uh, through the negotiation, then the finally the technical options have been, uh, will be selected. Also, if it is a question of the spring protection, then uh, the whole catchment and the spring yield and everything is investigated. And if it's a question of the hand dark well, then also the site selection is selected. So, so this field appraisal is very much then confirming that the technology choice is the correct one. Okay, thank you. Um, the next one, I think this must be somebody on your team. He's asking about the yeah. um, CMP, if you could talk a little bit about the ongoing CMP research project. Yeah, yeah. I saw also, uh, before there was another question also asking that is there any kind of materials which really shows uh, that this community managed project is really, uh, uh, it's, it's some kind of comparative studies which can be used also outside of Ethiopia to prove that the CMP really works. Uh, so in our website you can find now also this uh, WSP Africa evaluation report. And at the moment we have a research program ongoing for one PhD and then three uh, MSc level studies and one BSc level study. So we really like to bring more scientific uh, result uh, research to, to, to see what, uh, why we are preaching the CMP and how we can convince also the, the higher level decision makers and also the donors uh, to, to provide more funds uh, for WASH development here in Ethiopia. Okay, uh, thank you very much. Here is a question from Keith asking about uh, what other partners you're working with in Ethiopia and also about um, whether Ethiopia has been taking a swap approach in this sector. Okay, maybe the Kate came a little bit late, uh, but yes, definitely. There is a very strong and, and increasingly strong uh, was sector uh, cooperation and coordination ongoing at the moment in Ethiopia. Um, as I said, that there is already a memorandum of understanding for the cooperation and coordination of WASH is now ready, and it's just waiting for the signing of this four major partners, which are the Ministry of Water, Ministry of Health, Ministry of Education, and Ministry of Finance. And same time also, already there is a, a national WASH implementation framework, which is the main strategy guiding the sector-wide approach 
in WASH in Ethiopia. So we have also started already the, the preparatory work that, uh, that within 15 months the Ethiopia should be really ready to start at some level the, the swap uh, and, and the sector implementation in WASH in Ethiopia. Okay. Um, we have a question from Susan asking about how access to credit is enabling multiple use services. We, you didn't talk about that, at least as I remember in it, about what the wa yeah. whether the water is being used only for drinking or multiple uses such as agriculture and livestock. So I, that's how I understand this question. Sure. Yeah, sure. Um, yes. Um, Normally, uh, when the project uh, proposal is coming from the community, it might already include some MUS component. And, uh, and uh, at the moment, the, the project has certain uh, at annual level, the, the district is planning that the project cost this, this much and this much, uh, which they can uh, then agree together with the community. If the project proposal uh, uh, funding proposal is within that accrued limits and it also includes some MUS components, they can be already included into the grant agreement with the community. But if it goes beyond uh, the, the ceiling set by the district, then for the other MUS components the community has to start negotiate with the microfinance institution and that funding is then on loan basis from the microfinance. And uh, at the moment the microfinance has already opened uh, different kind of products for MUS component where the most uh, used component is the, the irrigation part. So there is a clear procedure already existing from the Microfinance Institute to offer to the community what needs to be done and how to apply the, the, uh, the credit to, to make the irrigation from the existing drinking water supply if there is a surplus water available. Okay, thank you. Um, I'm not sure I completely understand this question, but it sounds interesting to me. It says the World Bank attempted a similar approach previously and faced challenges. What lessons are taken from such challenges? And perhaps Tesfai and Bob would like to chime in on this one as well. But Arto, would you like to take a first stab at the at, at I, I take this as somehow a question of what you have learned from the World Bank in your in in, in incorporated it into your project? Yes, um, especially my experience, I think so that World Bank, I'm not sure whether they have attempted similar approaches in Ethiopia, uh, but uh, when I was working in Nepal, uh, there was a uh, water supply and sanitation fund board uh, funded by the World Bank, and also in that project, uh, the funds were uh, channeled for the implementation to the community, but in, in that approach the district employed an NGO to manage together with the community the funds. So, so in, in Nepal it was a combination of the community and NGO together and they were implementing the project together. And some problems were uh, experienced in that approach uh, about the uh, the problems that the, the NGO didn't listen enough to the community's opinions and like that. Maybe that's why maybe you have more for that one. And Bob, please come in. Can I come in? Can I come in? Yes, take it away, yeah. Tesfai. Yeah. Uh, thank you. Uh, World Bank, uh, by taking into account uh, the experience uh, both from the uh, previous social fund rural water supply component as well as also uh, from uh, community development fund approach that uh, this program has been trying uh, in Amhara region, took lessons and then prepared a big uh, water supply and sanitation project which is also currently ongoing, uh, and then prepared uh, that project uh, by taking important lessons, particularly in terms of uh, building the capacity down at the community level as well as also at the district level. 
Uh, and then to that respect, uh, we introduced uh, some, uh, some new capacity building arrangements in a stepped uh, approach way so that communities and districts uh, first uh, need uh, to fulfill certain, certain aspects in order to mature and then graduate and then get the next level of assistance. In fact, uh, that lesson was uh, even considered very well by the government and then uh, uh, has been reflected in the policy uh, document of the government uh, whereby we introduced what we call it a Warada Support Group. Uh, because in Ethiopia, up to a certain time, uh, the sector, the water supply and sanitation sector, was was not extended uh, beyond uh, the sub-regional level. Uh, districts were not having uh, uh, specific water sector uh, government office and like that one. So, in order uh, for regional governments to provide that kind of district level planning, uh, district wide uh, wash planning and implementation uh, exercise, we uh, suggested a capacity building component that uh, uh, will shuttle from uh, regional centers and then reach uh, districts to organize them. Uh, to prepare uh, a district-wide uh, water supply and sanitation program uh, to prioritize and then to implement. But as you clearly indicated, uh, we have faced uh, that challenge, the mere size of the country itself and also the available resources uh, that we have uh, uh, was was a big a big challenge. That is why I raised right at the beginning. Uh, in fact, I can say that the World Bank's uh, program was in between what we have under this community managed program and uh, what the government is doing, uh, because the existing capacity, uh, to be frankly, uh, I mean just to be honest will not allow the government to have this level of capacity building that we are dreaming under under this program. That is why the World Bank program designed somehow uh, in between uh, uh, an average kind of just capacity building program. But even that program is having a challenge because, as I said, the government <laughs> cannot meet the capacity building requirements. Uh, in Ethiopia, the government is very good in terms of accepting new innovations, including them in their policy document. But the question that I have is uh, to put that into practice. I know that the government uh, will buy into this uh, community management idea. They will not raise any questions. But I am, I am looking forward uh, how far the government is going to endorse this particularly from their own resources. That is why uh, I raised from the very beginning the scalability of uh, this. Otherwise, if this, uh, the World Bank's program was, by the way, we offered the program uh, to be a guinea pig uh, so that to take the sector to a sector-wide approach. Uh, and then what Arthur indicated, the WASH implementation framework, and all this is uh, also being used uh, using the World Bank's program as a platform uh, to go to a sector-wide approach. But the question again and again, I wish government, uh, government participants on this session to respond to this, uh, but uh, the one question that I would raise again and again is that will this be scaled? Uh, can this be scaled up? <laughs> using government resources. Because the capacity building requirement here is that we have to repeatedly discuss, have a session with communities, prospective communities. We, I know that this program has uh, spent time and then money, particularly in bringing the microfinancing institutions to this level, because uh, the microfinancing institutions in Ethiopia were primarily established uh, to promote agricultural growth, particularly uh, peasant agriculture, 
and then they were established uh, to facilitate financing facilities uh, to the agricultural sector and then primarily they were uh, kind of just rolling uh, rolling kind of just banking and then financing arrangement they were not they were uh, resistant to accept new ventures of uh, uh, financing and I know that the program has spent again time and money even to the extent of uh, introducing the new format training the microfinance institution uh, workers to understand the situation. But my question is again, this by itself, when we aggregate the capacity building that is needed to bring uh, this program, still I question whether that is manageable by the government and then eventually lead us to scale it all over the country. Thank you. Okay. Bob, did you want to add anything on that? If I could, just quickly, um, just one minute. The, in the original bank rural water supply project that African Development Bank adopted also, the objective was to build the capacity in the country needed to build a national rural water and sanitation program based on water to project, water to programs. As Testify said, there's always been a couple of fundamental issues or problems in building the capacity you need. One is turnover of staff at the WORDA and the regional level, so you keep losing the knowledge you have. The other is the funding that the government is willing to put into capacity building. So those are always there no matter what you do. In terms of have we have has community based you know contracting been successful and it, can the World Bank do that? The answer is yes. In in Ghana we started with a very similar approach of a district based approach where the districts did all of the procurement. In the second project we were able to make the shift to where communities did the procurement, even of boreholes. And so you know, if we say, well, we're going to hold this capacity or hold community-based procurement and financing hostage to having the capacity you need to do it, we'll never make that step. So you could have argued that in Ghana. You have to make the step to community-based procurement. But I don't think that means that you have to use um, you know, microfinancing institutions. I mean, the money has to go through the water because they are the ones that are accountable for the money that comes to their water or district. So the question is, first, is the water prepared to put, give money down to the, the individual communities to manage and to pay for their uh, works or not? And if you can get a microfinance institution involved, there's certain great advantages to that, as Arto has explained. There's also increased complexity, so you weigh those off. But the options ought to be there. The important thing is to take the step and don't hold it hostage to capacity building, because that's going to take another 20 years. Thank you. Okay, thank, thank you very much, Bob. Unfortunately, I'm afraid we're going to have to end it there, because we're really at the end of the webinar. There are some great questions that we couldn't get around to. Arto, I'm going to send you uh, a copy of those. And if you or someone on your team has a chance to, to give some written answers to those uh, remaining questions, we will post them on the World Bank website. But in the interest of time, I'm afraid I have to um, quickly move to the closing. So thank you to everyone. And again, the recording of this will be posted on our webinar, I mean on our, our web page, and you can access that by hitting the uh, get more information. Arto's PowerPoints will also uh, be there. Next week's w webinar is by Andrew Trevitt of UNICEF. I'm sure that's going to be a great one. So I really encourage you all to not only attend, but to get the word out through your social media networks and your friends and word of mouth, et cetera, because the more people we have here, the more fun it is. So I hope to see you. Oh, and, and by the way, there's this e-discussion is now going on on um, 
on the RWSN discussion <laughs> group, which you can also access through the web page. So see you next Tuesday. Goodbye for today. Bye.